Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division uh, provides scientific support to all the national park units. We help parks understand the current state of their resource conditions, what the effects of pollution are on visitor experience and wildlife, and give them suggestions for how they might reduce pollution, mitigate its consequences. Inside Science TV. Noise and light pollution are interesting because most other forms of pollution involve matter. The pollution we work on involves energy and has the interesting property that as soon as you do something about the source, the environmental conditions improve immediately. Historically, the Park Service got interested in, in noise pollution when the Grand Canyon National Park was enlarged in 1975 by Congress. The legislation spoke of natural quiet as a resource and a value to be protected in the park. Noise interferes with hearing just like smog interferes with scenic quality. For visitors, the consequences are a sort of degradation of the quality of their experience. For wildlife, the consequences are more severe since subtle sounds of nature often play critical roles in predator-prey interactions and other, you know, literally, life and death matters. There is a real potential for noise impacts. Ultrasound, for the frequencies above um, our nominal range of hearing, atmospheric absorption is really strong. It fades out very quickly with distance. Infrasound, on the other hand, is a very different matter. Uh, infrasound carries so far across the landscape that infrasound from breaking waves on both coasts of the United States can actually be measured in the Rockies. Good news is that there are very few organisms that are sensitive to it, more sensitive to low frequency sounds than we are. Our division has been systematically monitoring sound levels throughout the national park system from about 600 sites in over 80 park units. Even though that sounds like a lot of data, we have fairly sparse coverage of all the national parks. There are more than 400 national park units. So we've begun creating a model that predicts what sound conditions are throughout the national park system from these 600 sites. We've recorded for about a million and a half hours in aggregate across all these different sites. About 25% of that hour, or 15 minutes, will have audible noise. This is true even in remote wilderness areas in national park units. And the primary factor, as you might uh, suspect, is aircraft noise. We can make a difference really quickly by making sure that our own transportation systems are as quiet as today's technology can reasonably allow. We're investigating the use of quiet pavements on many of our roads. Congress requires that we work with the FAA, which manages the airspace, to develop air tour management plans for every park where commercial air tours take place and to shift the traffic into places where there'll be fewer noise sensitive receptors on the ground. Post signage in some places to advise visitors that we'd like them to be quiet. And we found just by asking, it was equivalent to cutting the number of visitors in the park by half. Modifying environments by improving light and sound conditions offer one of our best opportunities for making a sort of a compensating improvement to environmental quality to help both the quality of visitor experience in parks and the integrity of ecosystems to sort of improve and be sort of buffered against some of these other environmental changes. Inside Science TV. If you enjoyed this edition, follow us on the web and social media. Powered by the American Institute of Physics and a coalition of underwriters.